Um, and I did forget to tell you all that this session is focused on the watershed. So um, continuing in that vein, next up is David Van Horn, University of New Mexico, Department of Biology, which I graduated from probably before you were born. Anyway, his talk is going to be water quality monitoring the middle of the ground. All right, thank you. Um, so the broad goal of my talk here, actually, is there a blazer for me? There's, okay. Uh, the broad goal of my talk here is to introduce you to a water quality monitoring network that we um, in, uh, began installing about 13 years ago, that we've been uh, using to collect data ever since. Um, I want to show you a little bit about the, the types of data we've been collecting, uh, what science, scientific questions we've been um, answering with this data. And uh, I also really want to try to spawn some um, conversation from you all about other ways that we could potentially use this data. Uh, oh, and um, I'm kind of doing the introductory talk here, and there's going to be three other talks uh, following my talk um, that all utilize this, this large data set. So I thought I'd start off by just talking a little bit about the history of water quality sampling in the Rio Grande. Um, we obviously aren't the first folks to be doing this sort of work. Uh, there's been a bunch of good work by the USGS and by some other um, uh, however, if you dig into each one of these um, papers and, and reports, you'll find that most of this work has been done with uh, grab sampling. So grab sampling is when um, a researcher goes out to the river, grabs some water, takes it back to the lab, and analyzes it. And grab sampling is great. It's very useful. Um, but grab sampling uh, happens on one time scale, right? It happens at, at best the weekly sort of time scale, but more realistically, monthly, quarterly, or maybe yearly. And so there are a lot of things that are happening from a water quality perspective in between um, when grab samples are being taken. And so when we first started this project, we realized that there was sort of this hole in um, what data were available for water quality in the middle of your So we began this work in 2006, back when I was a PhD student. Um, this has been funded continuously by the US Army Corps of Engineers. And we kind of done this work in um, And our goal to begin with was to just assess the temporal and spatial water quality trends in the middle of Um, this is a map of our study sites. We installed these four southern study sites first in 2006 and 7. Um, let's see, they're at the uh, Hermelita US 550 bridge, Alameda, Rio Bravo, and 95 bridges. Um, and then following uh, the Los Conchas fire, we installed three northern sites at Leiden, which is just down from San Gudo, um, on the Chama and Chimita, and and at each one of these sites, we, we uh, have one of these instruments deployed. It's um, a YSI water quality sonde, and it measures five parameters, uh, pH, turbidity, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, and temperature uh, every 15 minutes. Um, oh, we also have some other sort of more high-tech, uh, newer nutrient uh, sensors that we've installed at a couple of these sites as well. And these instruments collect data every 15 minutes. So next, I'm just going to briefly show you what our sites look like, um, working from north down to south. Um, this is our site on the Chama and Chimita, and this is our northern um, site on the main site itself at Leighton. And that's what we consider our reference site. Um, we had this site installed upstream of Cochiti uh, for about six years until we had some sedimentation issues. We recently moved up to the Dark Diversion. Um, we've had this site at the Bernalillo uh, US 550 bridge since 2007, and we've had a site at Alameda as now on the Great Bypass Channel because we have had better luck keeping our instruments wet in that, in that channel than in the main stem. And uh, we've had a site that's on the Rio Bravo, and we had one at I-25 until about a year and a half ago when we moved downstream to the sled. So we've got all these instruments in the water. Uh, what kind of data are we actually collecting? What does that actually look like? What I'm showing you here is our complete data set from our um, Bernalillo US 550 site for four different water quality parameters. And we're looking at 11 years of relatively continuous data. And so we've got temperature, water temperature on the top here. You can see those nice seasonal variations in water temperature. Then we've got specific conductance, um, there's kind of baseline, and then a whole bunch of spikes for the storm events. This is what the dissolved oxygen data looks like. It's kind of inverse of water temperature. Um, but there's Quite a bit of noise in there as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. And this is what turbidity looks like. Once again, baseline value with a whole bunch of spikes due to storm events. So um, 
This is about 1.5 million data points, and over the past 13 years, we've collected over 10 million data points in total. So, great, we have a lot of data. What can we do with it? Um, well, first of all, we think that uh, this, the data kind of falls into two use, broad uses. First of all, it really helps us understand what are the baseline conditions that organisms, organisms in the river are living in. And so, what are the baseline, you know, sort of basic water quality parameter conditions for these organisms? Um, we can also take some of those, um, those basic variables and do some modeling to estimate some other baseline conditions, such as ecosystem respiration and primary production. Um, and this is work that Betsy uh, Summers has been doing. Um, and she'll be giving a talk about this in a little bit. Um, and then on top of these baseline conditions, once we kind of know what the baseline conditions are, um, we can also use this data to really understand how do all these disturbance impacts uh, affect the water quality and thus the organisms that are living in the river. And so over the last 13 years, we've collected um, disturbance events, including wildfire, uh, impacts, um, the impacts from stormwater inputs, and impacts from drought and flood. Okay, so next I want to show you just two quick um, sort of case studies of what we've been doing with the data over the last uh, over the last decade. I was going to try to do six of these little case studies and realize no matter how fast I talk, I can never get those in four minutes. So, um, so we're just going to do two. One is a baseline study, uh, and one is a disturbance study. And so um, ever since we installed these instruments, one of the things I've really been interested in is, um, like I mentioned earlier, stream metabolism. Uh, the reason that's so important, the reason that's so important is um, if we understand uh, where, um, when, and how much gross primary production is occurring in the Rio Grande, um, it gives us a lot of information about uh, resources that are available for the organisms that are living there. Um, so, like I said, I always wanted to do this work, never had time. Thankfully, that's what graduate students are for. Um, and so Betsy did a whole bunch of modeling work, and she took nine years' worth of data at a single site at our US uh, 550 site. And she ran a relatively involved uh, model to estimate gross primary production. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one little part um, one of her, her questions here was, um, if we have data from nine different years, how much interannual variability is there in the gross primary production that's happening in the group? And so I'm just going to focus on data from June. It's kind of hard to see here. Each one of these boxes is a different year. And what you can see is um, uh, from one June to the next, there can be drastic changes in the amount of gross primary production occurring. Uh, so during some years, there's less than um, 0.5 grams of oxygen uh, per meter square per day um, in, in gross primary production. In other years, there's eight times uh, more gross primary production per So this lets us know that um, GPP is not stable in the river, uh, that it's highly variable. And so the next question was, well, what's impacting that? And it turns out that the, the, the most um, impactful variable is discharge. So as discharge increases, we see GPP decline relatively dramatically. Um, so each one of these dots on here is a year is uh, GPP data from June um, versus the average discharge for that month. And it also turns out that um, that relationship is related to the ENSO cycle. And so during El Nino years, GPP is a lot lower than during La Nina years because um, flow events. Uh, Flow is a lot higher than it was only in the years. Um, so I think this is one example of a way we've been able to leverage this long-term data set to ask questions that you could never ask with short-term data. Um, oh boy. <laughs> Three minutes. Uh, okay, so um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, how we use this data to look at how services impacted the middle area ground and water quality here. And we, I'm going to focus on data from the Columbia 550 site. And here we use um, the entire data record that we have from that site, as well as a little bit of data from a couple of other sites, to look at how the forest, the Los Conscious Fire, um, impacted the salt oxygen concentration in the river. And once again, the beauty behind this really long term data set is we had a couple of years of pre fire data, which is in green here, and this is the geo data. 
And what you can see is that there aren't any DO sags here. The DO is relatively constant. Um, then the fire hits, and we see massive products of sags down to the zero milligrams per liter uh, repeatedly. Um, during 2011, a few sags in 12, um, some additional sags in 13, and then we start to see recovery. Um, we were also able to use the spatial extent of our network um, to follow some of these sags downstream. And so this is data from um, our Bernalia site down to the Isla site. And you can see that these um, dissolved oxygen sags uh, propagate throughout the river system over 50 river kilometers. Um, next, I'm just going to flash up a couple of, um, uh, of a list of basically all the baseline studies that we've been working on over the years. These are all the um, impacts from disturbances that we've documented over the years. And I want to leave you with a few conclusions. Um, first of all, water quality data are fundamental for understanding the local conditions and stressors in the river. And the data we've collected suggests that the Middle Rio Grande is a dynamic system with wide spatial and temporal variation. And the near continuous data has really allowed us to document the impacts from episodic events as well as the spatial and temporal variation. Um, finally, uh, you might think that 13 years of data is enough data and we should just stop collecting it. Um, we think that uh, it's pretty important to continue this data collection um, because we never know when one of these episodic events is going to occur, and you really need good pre and post disturbance events uh, data in order to figure out um, how those events impacted water quality. And we also need long term data sets to, to look at how climate change is going to impact um, water quality in this system. Uh, one last thing there are data gaps here. There's some short data gaps and long data gaps. The short data gaps are caused by um, this, sort of, this sort of issue. This is a really difficult system to work with. Um, manufacturers actually send us instruments in order to test, to test them in the Rio Grande, because if they work here, they'll work here. <laughs> so, so those are the short data gaps. The long data gaps come from funding gaps. And we had one of those in 2009. We're in the middle of one of those right now. We just started one. So this data is no longer in effect. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, questions? So on the on the primary credit table, um, is that on a like per volume basis? Because we, we think of high weighing of years of lots of water as a year to their fish, but the primary productivity is lower. So is that on a like volume basis? Or it's on a, a meter squared basis. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. How do small changes in temperature matter in a highly spatial and temporal variable system? <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not what can you tell me a little bit more, Joel? Yeah, yeah. So if you had a small change in the average temperature, uh -huh. would, would you be able to see an impact given the great variation you're seeing in the system? In impact in an animal or a genealogy, say, or something like that, like productivity? Um, a small change in temperature, probably maybe not, um, but I guess it also depends on when it's occurring. Um, so I'm not really a fish person, but we have used this data to look at. Uh, thermal regimes and oh sorry <laughs> we have these data to look at uh, uh, how thermal reg regimes impact um, Justin you know you know this this work a lot better than I do well I guess one of the one example where we did identify uh, change in, in thermal conditions is was during the 2014 snowmelt pulse where uh, Bureau and the Corps were talking about when should we release water out of the bottom. And uh, I remember Carolyn saying, Oh my god, there's gonna be a, a storm event and freaking out about that. And we did see it that temperature, the diurnal maximum for Danny for those several days. But back to your question as to you know being able to assess the thermal regime from a single point located primarily in the phthalate. Um, we all know that there's a lot of lateral uh, variability, but with the data collected, we are assuming that the rivers won't mix. Um, 
So some small changes, probably not, but um, some, some large changes, probably. Through your data, are you able to tease out? Are you able to tease out the uh, um, impacts of that the dams have on the change in water temperature and quality? <laughs> That's a great question. It's something that we haven't explicitly looked at yet, um, but it's been on the list of, of projects to tackle. Thank you.